1967 Monaco Grand Prix wasn't your ordinary race day. It unfolded as one of the darkest chapters in F1 history. This wasn't just about roaring engines and checkered flags. It was a show that had everyone on the edge of their seats. This race had everything. A chaotic start, a breathtaking crash, a car engulfed in flames, and sadly, the loss of one of the brightest stars in F1. May 7th was the day everyone had been waiting for, the big race in Monaco. But before Monaco, a lot had happened in the five months since the season's first race in South Africa. Teams were busy fine-tuning their cars to make them even better for the upcoming races. Also, the engines of these F1 cars were tweaked to make them nimbler, going from 3.0 to 2.5 litres. As for the Monaco circuit, it pretty much stayed the same as before, but there was a slight change. They moved the start-finish straight a bit closer to saint devot The stage was perfectly set for an exciting race. Before coming to Monte Carlo, there were surprising wins by Dan Gurney at the Race of Champions and Mike Parks at the International Trophy. These unexpected wins added a buzz of excitement heading to Monte Carlo. Now, with everything in place, 16 drivers geared up to start the race. On the starting grid, Jack Brabham was up front in his Brabham, with Lorenzo Bandini next to him in the super popular Ferrari. Other racers like John Surtees and Dennis Holm were eager to show their skills on the world stage of racing. The race started with Bandini taking the lead in his roaring Ferrari. But things got wild as Jack Brabham's car broke down, causing a mess that Bruce McLaren and Joe Siffert couldn't avoid. Jim Clark had to leave the track too, after slipping on oil from Brabham's broken car. Denny Holm and Jackie Stewart zoomed ahead of Bandini as the race went on, having an exciting battle for the top spot. They kept going at it until Stewart had some bad luck. His car's crown wheel and pinion gave up, stopping him suddenly. This gave the tough New Zealander, Holm, the perfect chance to take the lead, with Bandini in second and McLaren, another Kiwi, close behind. As the race continued, Bandini and his Ferrari started catching up to Holmes Brabham. Lap after lap, the excitement grew. But then, on lap 82, everything went terribly wrong. Bandini's Ferrari collided with the wooden barriers, demarcating the chicane, sending the car into a chaotic spin. The impact broke off the left rear wheel, flipping the car upside down in the middle of the road with Bandini trapped beneath. The roll bar didn't do its job well, and the car quickly caught fire. Surprisingly, the first ones to run to the scene weren't the firefighters, but an unexpected trio, a photographer, a doctor, and the prince of Bourbon Parma, an automobile enthusiast. Even when the marshals showed up, they tried using small fire extinguishers, but it was tough because they didn't have the proper gear. So, they made a plan to flip the car back over and rescue Bandini, who was stuck and shouting in pain. They used ropes to turn the car, being careful not to hurt Bandini even more. Once they got him out, another issue popped up. Fuel was still pouring out of the car, and even after they got Bandini out, it caught fire again. A helicopter made things worse by blowing the flames towards the track. But these brave folks didn't stop. They kept going, trying to save Bandini, even with the fire and danger around. Bandini was eventually rushed to a hospital. The whole scene was scary with fire climbing up and taking everything. It was a moment nobody there would ever forget. Despite the hard work of top French and Italian doctors for three days and nights, Bandini, who was 32 years old, sadly passed away because of severe burns from the fiery crash. It was really sad news, especially because just a few hours before he died, doctors had cautiously mentioned a bit of improvement in his condition. But the pain and suffering from the crash were too much for him. Dr. Michael Henderson, in his book Motor Racing and Safety, talks about what happened to Bandini. He says Bandini got stuck because the people trying to help didn't really know what to do. They didn't have good training or the right equipment. Bandini got really hurt when his car crashed into the wall and it was so bad that he couldn't move. Maybe he was even knocked out for a bit. And the reason why the car turned into an inferno was that the aluminum tanks, holding a lot of petrol, ripped open due to the crash. The Ferrari, like all other 1967 Grand Prix cars, didn't have a built-in fire extinguishing system. All these things added up to Bandini getting deadly burns. Even though the burns are what made him die, the other things, like being trapped and getting really hurt in the crash, were also a big deal. Dr. Henderson thinks that if those things were different, 
Bandini might have lived. Holm kept going and easily won his first Formula One race. Holm was a guy who learned to drive trucks sitting on his dad's lap, far away from fancy places like Monaco, now triumphing on the big F1 stage. It was a huge win, but it got a bit overshadowed because we lost one of the racing stars. After this sad race, they made serious changes to how F1 was done. They said, no more straw bales on Grand Prix tracks. They did this to make things safer. They also started making special clothes for drivers and track marshals. These clothes could handle fire better, you know, to keep everyone safe. And here's another thing they did. They put strict rules to stop TV camera crews from flying helicopters low over burning cars. It was all about making sure everyone was safe. This moment of sadness turned into a time to make racing better and safer for everyone. So what could have led to Bandini's awful crash? Well, he had this intense desire to win, no matter what. So he pushed himself and his car to the absolute limit. In Enzo's Ferrari's book, Belotti Che Gente, which is translated as drivers as people, he gave some thoughts about Bandini's tragic story. No doubt Ferrari might have his own way of looking at things, but it does give us a glimpse into what Bandini was feeling before the race. Ferrari recalled the week before the crash when Bandini talked to him about his worries. Bandini had this big competition with Scafiotti, another Italian driver on the team. The rivalry started in September 1966 when Scafiotti won the Italian GP in Monza. Bandini had just won Monza's 1,000 kilometers a few days before the Monaco GP, making the competition even fiercer. Bandini really wanted things to be calm for Monaco, and he didn't want Scafiotti as his teammate. He even showed Ferrari a newspaper that was making a big deal about the showdown between the two Italians. But what Bandini didn't say was that he saw in Scafiotti everything he wished he had. Scafiotti was a rich guy, always smiling, living an easy life, and he saw racing just as a way to make money with his own hands. Bandini felt jealous of his friend, whose racing career seemed so smooth. In an attempt to help Bandini, Ferrari picked Chris Amon as his teammate. But then Ferrari heard that instead of practicing for the Targa Florio in Sicily, Scafiotti was going to Monaco. When Bandini found out, he was shocked. Suddenly, all he wanted was to win the race, shifting his focus from personal rivalry to just wanting victory on the track. This desire resulted in Bandini pushing his car beyond the limit. Bandini, whose funeral drew a massive crowd of 100,000 people, was sadly one of 14 drivers who lost their lives in Formula 1 races during the 1960s. Back in the day, drivers took big risks to race. And the truth was, what they earned in their entire careers is what races like Lewis Hamilton make in just one race today. Even the crowd didn't stress much about safety in what people called a golden age for the sport, especially with gentlemen races being super popular. The old black and white footage from races in that time shows kids from crowded places sticking their legs over barriers just to get a better look at the race. It goes to show how little they cared about safety back then. So, what are your thoughts about what happened in Monaco in 1967? Let us know in the comments down below.